Hello. So today I have hopefully a treat for you. I hope you'll enjoy this, which is a classic Sudoku that I've constructed. And the goal here is both to have had constructed a uh, hopefully nice classic Sudoku for you guys with a uh, a very interesting uh, solve path if you if you do it the way I intended. <clears throat> I think that it's difficult to bypass <clears throat> without something at least as complex. So. Uh, I've had several people test this, and they've gone about it in different ways, but I'd like to show off kind of the way that, that I intended to solve it. And also afterwards, which is going to be the, the longer part of this video, I'm going to show how I set it. And I'm going to show off the solver tools that, that I have, in case you aren't familiar with them, or even if you are familiar with them, the, you know, how to, how to use them effectively and, and, and what the features are for and, and uh, how I used them to set this puzzle uh, in a relatively quick manner. I think I set this in about two hours, which without this tooling, I think I probably would never have been able to do so. So I don't know um, if that's good or bad. Um, I hope it's good in, in your in your eyes, but uh, we'll see. I'm hoping that you know by using these toolings, people will be able to to have an idea and actually bring it to fruition without as much frustration and in in hopefully a more effective way because you can go through more options and not go down bad paths and not get frustrated so that's my goal there and even if you just want to watch the the part with just how to solve this puzzle that's cool but i think a lot of people are interested in how puzzles get set i think those are some pretty popular videos on the ctc channel so i thought i would do my own for this one and hopefully I'll have my own perspective on things, and it might be very different than some of these other setters you've seen. So uh, I think the, the big takeaway, just to give a conclusion right at the start, the big takeaway is everyone has their own method of doing things. Sudoku is a single player game, and you can solve it however you'd like to. And also setting is in a way single player, but you know, as long as you enjoy your own puzzles, that's really what matters. And you know, if others enjoy it, that's a huge bonus and it feels great. So. With that said, I have gotten some good feedback on this puzzle, so I'm very happy about that. And I hope you guys enjoy it too. So if you would like to try it first, please check the link in the description and you can try this classic. Uh, do know that it is going to involve something fairly advanced. You're not going to find any typical patterns. You're going to have to get creative with it. So hopefully that doesn't, you know, make you shy away from it. But maybe with some stuff that you've learned on this channel about how to be creative with you know, alternating inference chains or set or something like that, you know, just try to find something interesting and see if you can solve it. So with that, uh, also, if you have not, if you enjoy my videos, if you've watched several of them and you haven't subscribed, please do hit the subscribe button. I am I have a goal of hitting a thousand subscribers. I just recently hit 500 and I'm really hoping to get to a thousand sooner or later. So every single person I absolutely appreciate uh, and you probably would call me crazy with how much I'm actually looking at my subscriber numbers, and I probably shouldn't, but um, I love it when that number goes up, and I'm very sad when it goes down. So hopefully you guys can make me happy. So with that, I am going to show you how to solve Schwing. All right, so we can start by looking at ones. So these ones all look into this box, and that places a one here. Additionally, uh, column nine is just a bunch of hidden singles. So we can start by asking where eight goes. There's two eights here. They looked out. That's a hidden symbol here. And then we, we have a four that sees these two. So And we need a four in the column. So four goes there. We do need a five as well. And the last one is a nine. These two fives now look into here. And that places a hidden five here. This two looks over, placing a two here. What's left for this box? We have a one, two. We need three. We have four, five. We need a six. In this box... Here we have a one and a two. We need three. We have four. We need five and six. Sorry, we need five and nine. Yeah, but this nine sees here and the five sees over here. The nine is in one of these two. And there's a there's a helicopter. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Um, this nine sees over here. And these two nines point down. So there's a nine in one of these two. Additionally, we have these sixes that look in. That places a six here and a nine here. This six sees up, placing three and six. Uh, this three sees down, placing a five there. So now we have a three nine pair. And the rest for this box, we uh, should be able to place some. So we have a one. We need a two. 
but two goes in one of these two. We have three, we need a four, which goes here, and then we need a five, and the five sees there, so this is two and this is five. Additionally, we have these fives looking into the center box, and this five looks over now, so we have a five in the center here, and fours are looking in, and this four looks over, so that does place a four here as well. You can see that in this bottom row, we just have a one, two pair remaining, which just can't be resolved yet. And let's see, what else can we do? So we're a little bit restricted. We're restricted in this box here. So we have a one, two. We need three, four. We have five. We need six and seven. So this can't be a six. Three, four, seven. This one can't be a four. Um, additionally, if we look, we have a 7-6 here, and none of these have 7-6, and so the intersection here should be pretty restricted. So in this cell here, we need a 1, but we have 2. We need 3. We have 4, 5 in the box, 6, 7 in the row, 8 and 9 in the columns. And this one here, we have a 1. We need 2 and 3. We have 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9 in that column as well. And so I think you might be able to find a little bit more than this, but it's at this point that things might start beginning a little bit dry. So let's go over the technique that I intended, because it's absolutely possible to do here. In fact, you can do it right from the start if you want. So the first question to ask is, where does 2 go in this column? Well, this cell can be 2, and I'm going to use a 2 quarter mark here uh, just to mark that that green means a 2 can go here. And a 2 can go here, but 2 can't go here and 2 can't go here because of these two givens. And then the rest of the column is filled with givens, so those can't be 2. And then in this row, where can 1 go? Well, this one can be a 1, and this can be a 1, but this can't because of the given one here. So I'm going to mark that blue. So if these were on the same digit, this pattern would be a two-string kite, which I think I went over in a different video. but. Let's just pretend that these were also where ones were limited. Well, what could we say about this? Well, we could say a one is in one of these two, and a one is in one of these two. Remember, we're pretending that this is ones. But we can't repeat the one in the box. So I could have a one in both of these, or I could have a, a one, one one in box eight, and then a one in, a green, in the, one of the outer green or blues. But what I can't do is have neither of these be a one, because that would force one for this row to be here, and one for this column to be here, thus making this two ones in a box. So that's the standard two-string kite. And what the result of that would be is we form a strong link between these two cells, between the ones in these two cells, and that strong link says one, at least one of these is a one. They both see here, and this would be now a three. It would eliminate the one. But of course, this isn't a two-string kite because these are twos and these are ones. But if you look, this cell here, which I'll mark purple, is a 1, 2 by value cell. So this serves the same purpose as the normal box restriction on a single value. And what do I mean by that? I mean, can this be 1 and this be 2? And the answer is no, because if this were 1 and this were 2, what would purple be? We've used up all its values. So we basically are going through these two weak links, and then there's a strong link between the 1 and the 2. And what we're saying is there's a now a weak link between the one in this blue and the two in this green going through the strong link here. So there's a weak link between the one in this blue and the one in this purple, meaning that if a one's in the blue, then there's not a one in the purple. Now, if there's not a one in the purple, then there is a two in the purple. So there's a strong link between the one and the two in the purple cell. And then... The, there's a weak link between the two in the purple cell and the two in the green cell, meaning if the, if the purple is a two, then the green is not a two. And so now we have a, a alternating inference chain, AIC, where we have weak link, strong link, then back to weak link. And so what we can say is that between the one and the two in these two cells, there is a weak link. They cannot both be true. And so that's the same as it as in our normal kite formation. So this actually is a kite, and what this is saying is this is a 2, or this is a 1, or both, but not neither. 
And if you think about it, if neither one were true, if this isn't a one and this isn't a two, that forces a one here and a two here, and that breaks the purple cell. So we can actually use the weak link here as our, our weak link that we'd normally have naturally for a two-string kite. And we can say there's now a strong link between the one here and the two here. And so now what that means is at least one of them's true. And so let's look at what effect that has on these two orange cells here. Well, if green here is a two, then this orange cell is a three. If blue here is a one, this orange cell is a three. So, and we know that one of those at least is true. And now actually we can prove that only one of them is true. But at least one of these is true, meaning at least one of these orange cells is a three, meaning one of these orange cells is a three. So we can actually say three is limited to these two orange cells. And the, the immediate effect of that is all of these cells, including this one here, can't be three anymore because all of those are seen by both of these orange cells. Here they're seen in the box, and here they're seen in the row. And that's, of course, very important for this cell here, which is now a 9. That puts a 3 here. And from here, we should be able to solve the puzzle pretty cleanly. We just have to remember that 3 can't be in any of these reds. So now, with these 3s here, 3 is limited to one of these two. If we uh, fill in this column here, we need, we have a one, we need two, three, we have four, five, six, we need seven and eight. Remember, this one can't be three, this also can't be three, and this can't be three. And so now what we've done is we've either could say this is a hidden single three now, because this can't be three, or we have a two, seven, eight triple. Either way, that does put a three here, which now puts a two here because of our mark. Remember, these, these couldn't be two. Uh, because of these two given twos. I just didn't mark that yet. And then this sees an 8, so that's 7, that's 8. This 2 has the effect that we expected. It puts a 3 here, a 1 here, and a 1 here. This can no longer be 1. And now I can get rid of these red uh, markings just to keep things cleaner because we have the 3 placed. And in fact, this is now a single. This is an 8. This one sees the purple cell, that's now a two, that's a one. Left in the box, we have one, two, three, four. We need a, uh, we have five, six, seven as well. We need eight and nine. So we, have, we can just fill that in. Um, here we have a pair as well. We need a three and we need a seven. So that seven and that three look up. Here, this is a triple. We need a two. We have three, we need four. It's a 2-4 pair, and so now this last one is going to be a, a uh, what am I missing, a 5. And this box here, we need a, a 1. It goes, up, uh, goes exactly here. We have 2, we need a 3, which goes down here. We have 4, 5, we need 6. Looks like it can go anywhere, unless I'm scanning poorly and an 8, which goes down here. And so now this is a naked single 6. This is a 3-8 pair. This should now also be a naked single 5. Oh, I missed that. Um, naked single 9. This is a triple. We need a 2. I'm just going to go in one of these two. We have 3, 4, 5. We need 6 and 7. So 6s go here. 7s go here. I don't believe anything is looking at that. There's a 6, 7 in this column. I think I have too many. Yeah, this can't be 3. So now this is 2, 4, 6 triple. Uh, this can't be a 6. So 3, 4, 9, 3, 4, 7. Okay. And we're just finishing up here. So for this box, we do need a 2 somewhere. So that goes right here. We need a 3. Threes are limited to one of these two, actually, because this is a pair, and we need a three and something else. We need a six. So this one's a six, this one's a three. That three sees down, eight and three, nine and eight. We need a four in this box as well. That has to go here because of this four. And we need a seven and a nine. So... 
this is the sorry this is the nine this is the seven this can't be three or four so this is seven this is two six and seven this is four and two this is a four three and six and there we go so that is solved so you can see that it was all singles after doing that move and in fact if you did this pattern right at the start without even doing any other basics it is all singles <laughs> after that it's just pretty funny so it turns a pretty difficult puzzle into a very trivial one so that was my intent actually and so hopefully i succeeded at that and i hope you enjoyed that so now for the the main portion of this video i want to go over how I set this and how my, my solver works and the tooling there. So if you are interested in installing my solver, it's completely free. It's also open source. So if you are a programmer, I am happy to take contributions as well on GitHub. And I will link both the instructions on how to install the solver as well as you know the main GitHub page if you're interested in that uh, in the description so you can see that. But first, let's go over how the solver works. And what I'm going to be showing is the integration into the site FPuzzles. All right, so here I have fpuzzles open, and I also have opened up my solver here, which is just a, right now it's in listen mode, so that means it's waiting for connections uh, from fpuzzles. And I also have the user script installed, so if I go to my dashboard, I actually have a bunch, but you can see that I have my fpuzzles Sudoku solver version 0.3.0 alpha. So if you're in the future, this version might be newer. Things might look a little bit different if I've modified things or added features, but at this moment, this is the version I'm on. And so I have this user script installed using Tamper Monkey. And what that does is it adds uh, this connect button here, this settings button here, and it and once we've connected, it adds this true candidates feature here using the solver. So one what I will do is I'm actually going to do a new grid, but I'm gonna do that in a new tab. So Let's just duplicate this tab here and let's go to new grid. So let's start over. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over what my thought process was for setting this. And we'll, we'll try to show off the tooling so that you can see how that works. And I'm going to be referencing the actual puzzle because obviously I don't remember perfectly how I went about this. So we'll be cheating a little bit. But I know, so if, if you remember, we had the twos limited to these two cells, which I'll mark in green. We had the one's limited to these two cells which i'll mark in blue so that was obviously by design i also had this starting out can only be a one or a three and this cell can only be a one or a two and also i built in this as only a one or a two um in this cell here which um is what causes the weak link between these two uh, cells between the one and the two candidates in those two cells. So that was the initial pattern that I started with. And I, I kind of just randomly decided which box I wanted that in, which direction I wanted to do it in. Um, it doesn't really matter because you can always transform the Sudokus around, but you know, you got to start somewhere. And so that was fairly arbitrary just based on my own aesthetics. So um, I'm going to highlight the same exact cells here, just in a blank grid. I'm going to highlight those green and I'm going to corner mark twos in there. And then I believe it was Yes, these two. I'm going to highlight blue and I'll kind of mark ones in there. And then I wanted a one, three here, a two, three here, and a one, two here. So I needed to make this happen, right? We can't just fill this and say, voila, there it is. I needed to add givens to the board to start with such that this would be true. And you know, you don't need a solver for this part, but I thought it would be nice to, to use it anyway here. So one, one thing I'm going to do first is I'm going to set up my settings here. So I've clicked this button up by the disconnect button for the solver settings, which is added by the user script. And let's just go over what these mean. So we have logical solve settings, and we can turn on and off the different parts of the logical solver. So we can say, you know, do we want you looking for fishes or not? Um, and so the point of this is when you're testing against a logical solve, you may have a particular difficulty in mind. And so you may not want it to say, oh, as, if you, as long as you use random contradictions, uh, it'll solve. So let, let's turn that off because we, we, we don't want that. We don't want contradictions getting in the way of, of our, our logic here. Um, I'm going to leave on fishes and wings because what I wanted was for this pattern, this pattern in my head is more complicated than something like a Y-wing or like a swordfish or something like that. 
Like that's someone's going to look for those first before they look for this. So I leave that on to make sure that if there are any fishes or wings, that the solver includes those in its logical solve. And I want the puzzle to not be solvable with just that. Um, additionally, I'm going to go to my true candidate settings here, and I'm going to turn on both of these features, the solution count and the include logical candidates. So what do these do? The solution count will color the candidates, which I'll, I'll show in a second. Um, but what it does is it colors them based on if I were to give that candidate, how many solutions would the puzzle have? And it goes from uh, one to eight. So with one solution yet left, that candidate will be green. That means if you give that candidate, you end up to exactly one solution in the puzzle. Um, for all other numbers of solutions between two and eight, you get varying levels of blue. You get a very, very light blue if there are you know, two, three low numbers of solutions, and you get a very dark blue at eight, and then it caps at eight. So if there's a million solutions, that's still the same dark blue as eight solutions. Um, and then include logical candidates. What this means is it not only runs the brute force solver to figure out exactly which candidates are possible, it also runs the logical solver and it compares them. And if they get different answers, then any candidates that the logical solver says are possible, but the brute force solver actually discovered aren't possible, will show up, but they'll be red. And what that means is don't give that candidate. You'll have zero solutions if you give that candidate. But if someone is using just these techniques, to try to logically solve your puzzle, they will think that candidate is possible. And so that's sort of a, a lens to view um, the puzzle through to go, okay, well, I know from the brute force perspective that a certain candidate isn't possible, but from a logical perspective, we're not able to eliminate it without using something more complex than these steps. All right, so those options are on. I'm sorry for the long explanation. And as soon as I do this, uh, it's going to replace my center marks. It leaves the corner marks alone, but it did replace my center marks because these are the actual candidates here. Remember, I wanted one, three here, two, three here. I'm going to mark those orange, and I'm going to mark this one purple. And my goal here, which I'm going to actually use corner marks because those get preserved, my goal is to have a one, two possible here, a one, two possible here, sorry, a, a one, three possible here, and a two, three possible here. So that, that's the pattern that I'm going for. So... The first thing I did is I think I focused on getting these twos to work. So if we look at the puzzle here, um, I did, I, I realized a few things. One is, um, I can't give a two in this box. And that's obvious, because if I give a two in this box, it's going to ruin the two candidates here and here, which I need. So how do I instead get this column to not have twos possible? Well, the easiest way to do that is just to put givens in there. Um, and so that's what I did, and I chose four and six. I don't think I did this exactly first, but I, again, I don't remember exactly what order I did, but I do remember I wanted to isolate this column first. So that, that four and six is there. Additionally, I, I figured I could give a single two over here. And again, I, I could have chosen... I can't give a two in this box, right? Because I need twos to be available here. So I figured I could give a single two in this box, and that could eliminate this two here, so I wouldn't have to give a given. But how do we eliminate this two right here? Well, I can't give a two over here because that ruins these orange cells. So because I can't give a two in the row, and I can't give a two in the column because I need a two in the column, the only option is to just stick a given here. And I chose nine at some point for that. And so finally, now we have twos up here that um, aren't available. And oops, I hit new tab. Um, right over here. So I played around at first with giving a two in this box, because that would eliminate all three of these right away. But I kept running into problems with that. So the iteration that I went with, I ended up giving a two just up here to eliminate it from the top here. And then I put in givens over here, the one and the five. And so this now succeeded in giving me twos limited to these two places here. And we can see that with the true candidates, of course, um, even, even the logical candidates. You can see right now the logic and the true candidates agree with each other because there's no red. And we have a ton of solutions because everything's dark blue. So it's still nice to be able to keep track of, of what goes where. Um, the next thing I did is I needed to limit the ones in this row. And so I used a, a similar technique here. So just referencing what, what my final solution was, I did end up giving a one in this box here. 
and I couldn't give it in row 9 because this needs to be a 1-2. So my only option was to give it in this row, and I decided to line it up there with the, with the 2. Um, I wanted to try to stick to these kind of blocks of givens, which gives it sort of a more aesthetic look and, um, you know, kind of hints towards it being constructed rather than, uh, by a human rather than a computer. Although, of course, you could program a computer to do that too, but anyway. Um, I gave this one here, so that uh, eliminated one from, from these three cells here. So now I'm down to just these three cells. And I didn't want to just give all three of these because I felt that that would be a bit too much. And so I, I, I wanted to use cross ones as much as possible. So I, I looked at, obviously I can't give a one here, and I could have given a one in either of these, and I chose to give a one here because it serves a cross purpose of eliminating a one from this orange cell as well, because I, need, I can't have one be an option in this cell. So it made sense to give this one here. Now these two, I didn't really have a good way, like this box is used, this box is used, I can't give a one in this box. Um, I could have given a one in, oh no, I can't give a one in this box either because of the purple cell, so I had to fill givens, so it was the only option. So I chose six and five, whoops, wrong way around. And you can see what happens here is if there's no solutions, just everything goes blank. So that's a five and a six there. And this serves also the purpose of, um, did it serve another purpose? These ones may not have. I was going to say it serves a purpose of eliminating from this blue cell, but that's not actually important. So, um, And how, do, how did I come up with which numbers to use? Well, um, I wish I could say it was anything more than just sort of feeling, like gut feeling of what numbers do I not have a, haven't used a lot of and would work well within there. And of course, I had lots of options to choose from. So, um, oops, I just used undo. So when you, when you use the undo stack, it, it gets rid of the coloring, but... You can just make a change and it'll bring that back. So this accomplishes what I needed in row seven, where a one is now only in the two blue cells, because this one has this given one, these three have this given one, and the rest are givens in the row. So this wasn't too bad, and this probably stayed basically how it was um, while I constructed the rest of the puzzle. But there were two more things I needed to do, right? This one needs to have just one and two as options, and the orange cells need to have and I lost my corner mark somehow. This needs one, three, this needs two, three, and this needs one, two. So how are we going to do that? Well, the one, two in the row, you can see I needed a three, seven, and nine seeing it. So what did I do? I just put a three, seven, and a, and a nine in the, in the row, eight as well. So I just said, okay, let's, let's, let's place some digits here. And, he, and, and these served additional purposes. This nine and eight were nice. Um, to eliminate from the oranges as well. So I gave nine and eight over there. I gave a seven here. And again, I was going for this sort of block look where, where the givens were clustered. So that's kind of why I chose those. And then here, this would block up, this would cluster with the one. And in my experience, when you cluster the givens, it also tends to avoid just completely collapsing the puzzle as well, because you're giving them so close together that they don't have as much effect. Um, and that, that might not actually be true, but in my experience, that's kind of what's happened. Um, with me. And so just by giving those, I mean, it's obvious now this is now a one, two only for the purple. And I needed to do something similar for the oranges, but you got to be really careful about how you do that. Um, so I have this nine, eight here. So I decided to give an eight, nine, oops, I just typed the wrong numbers. I decided to give an eight, nine here. And that just gets rid of the eight, nine for both of them. I don't have to worry about it. And here we get our first um, logical candidate that actually isn't possible. If I gave this two here, and I'll just show you, there are no solutions to the puzzle. Now, we could probably go and try to analyze why that is. Um, I don't actually care, but I just wanted to point out that feature. Um, so we can't give a two here, but we didn't want to anyway. Um, so we need to get down to one, three, and two, three. I decided, okay, what are the shared candidates here? And what I haven't really given in these columns or these rows much. So I decided to give a four and a five. And again, I wanted them clustered together. There was no reason to give them here other than here, but I did. And you can see that both logically and through the brute force, we could prove now that the five must go here. So we're, it's letting us know that there's really no reason to put a given here. It's going to logically become a five no matter what we do at this point. And then finally, we have the one, three, and the two, three, but we have this extra six and seven. 
And so why not use the row to get rid of the six and seven? Um, and so I clustered them over by this two here. There was no, it was just completely arbitrary that I chose, you know, the, the way that I did. But, you know, you got to seed the puzzle somehow. And at this point, I had what I needed. I had the, the ones here. I have the twos here. I have the one, two here. And what's really cool about this is logically it doesn't happen. But if you look at our red cells, look, all of these threes are red. And this, this proves through brute force um, the logic that I had here, where twos were limited here, ones are limited here, we have the one, two here, that makes a kind of two-string kite here, where either the two is seeing this three, making this a three, or the one is making this a three. And our, my brute force solver is recognizing that and saying, oh, look, can't give threes in any of these, including this green cell. And so that, that's, that's motivation. And so what we want to do now is we want to add givens to the puzzle such that we end up with a unique solution, but logically, we don't care about the, you know, obviously there's going to be a solution. These are going to collapse in, by the brute force solver into specific numbers. But logically, a one can still be in these two cells. A two can still be in these two cells. And I lost all my corner marks again. Um, I'll have to find out what's causing that. Um, I think it's when the grid blanks out. Um, and then this is a 1-3 and this is a 2-3. And so I need to preserve that logically. They can turn red, but they can't go away. Right? So just as a really dumb example, if I place a 3 here, all of this collapses into singles, and I've ruined my, my strategy. And notice all the red goes away as well. So I can't give this 3. Right, but I can instantly, and, and it may not be as obvious other places I could place something. And what I'm doing is I'm constantly looking at all my highlighted cells and going, "Please don't break, please don't break." Right, and th this was the hardest part of the puzzle is is basically you're you're exploring both your aesthetics as well as trying to figure out what's going on with that and trying to get to a unique solution without breaking that pattern that you built into the puzzle. So. At this point, I it took this was what took mo the majority of the time of setting, and like I said, it took about two hours to set, and so I had to experiment quite a bit. Uh, but what I ended up doing is placing um, the rest of these givens, and I'll, I'll try to remember somewhat what order I did. And I think what I saw was lots of candidates in box three. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to add givens into box three to sort of um reduce its possibilities also a lot in in row you know column seven has no givens in it at all so all i did was i said well i have this one five here let's give two things over here and it looks like i just decided on four and eight so i gave those and what i saw was okay yeah this this has a huge effect here and i think i probably experimented with putting different numbers here until it had both a large effect but didn't affect my pattern here and you're going to have to just kind of play around with it but here giving this four eight i have a lot of red candidates now and in fact you can see now i even have green candidates and i have some lighter blue candidates but these weren't these weren't super useful right if i put a seven here yes there's a unique solution but it's broken it's a unique solution logically as well which means it's broken my pattern my pattern's not useful anymore if i put a seven there same obviously a two here is going to break my pattern I think we could figure that out without the solver telling us that. Also, a 7 here breaks the pattern. Um, obviously, if I give an 8 here, now 2 is just a, a hidden single, so it's just going to you know, collapse. And you can see here, this is something I was noticing with a lot of these solutions, is I have a 2-7 deadly pattern here. And that's going to happen unless I give some kind of 2 or 7 somewhere, either removing the possibility for these to be 2 or 7 at all, or um giving one of these two sevens because they're you know it, i could get to this point at this point the only way to get rid of these and you can see the rest is completely filled is to have that that two seven there so um obviously we're not going to give that eight but i decided i want i needed to give one of these two sevens and i didn't want it anywhere near my pattern over there so i ended up giving this seven just to break up that deadly pattern you can see now a lot of these light blues have now turned green we have a lot more light blues because we've gotten rid of those two different solutions from the two seven deadly pattern there um and so you can see that i didn't actually give a whole lot more after that um and what i did give you can see we have the the two light blues here um and so i actually had to go through i was like okay uh what about this three? Oh nope how about this five 
well, it it preserves it, but then I wasn't able to follow up um, very easily. So um, maybe maybe some of this, like maybe this five and this three would have worked. Um, in fact, this looks like it could have been a valid puzzle. I just didn't discover that one. I think I had given this seven a bit later because um, I didn't realize this two seven deadly pattern was happening so much. Um, but what I ended up settling on was this seven here. And then I saw that this one turned green and I just gave it. So you can see at this point that logically we can't figure out the rest of this puzzle. Um, and this is ex basically exactly where we got when we were trying to solve, you know, solve it before doing this pattern. Um, but it w the brute forcer has green everywhere. Every single cell is green. And that's your hint that there's only one solution. And of course, you can go into here and you can do solution count. It says there's a unique solution. So just to double check. So at this point, there is a unique solution. And that is how I set the puzzle. And of course, after this, you want to try to test solve it and see how it goes. Um, but you can get a little hint to how that's going to go. I turned off two candidates already. If I hit clear here, um, you can just hit the solution path here and make sure you don't have the contradictions on still. You hit the solution path here. You can look at what it's doing. You can see I've got naked singles. I've got hidden singles. I've got a few tuples eliminated. And then no logical steps found. This is exactly where we get logically uh, without this. And then what I can do is I can use this feature called edit given pencil marks. And what that's going to do is say, um, I want to pretend that my logical solver figured out this pattern and eliminated threes from all of these red cells. So what I can do is I can, it, when, when I have this edit given pencil marks on, when I'm in center mode, it's going to add a, a third kind of pencil mark um, to that cell. So here, I'm going to pencil mark 7 and 9 here. And what that means is when using the solver, pretend that these are the only candidates possible in this cell. So even though it thinks 3, 7, and 9 are possible, I'm telling it it can't be 3. It can only be 7 or 9. Here I'm going to do 1, 2, 8, and 9. Here I'm going to do 2, 7, and 8. 2, 6, and 7. Um, 6 and 7 here. This red cell is two or eight only, and then this one's just a nine. I could have just filled a nine, but you know, might as well do it this way. And so now, when I turn on the true candidates again, you can see that the puzzle is solves. Because now the the both the logical and the brute force solver agree that um this is these are the only possibilities. The other thing I could do, which is also um sometimes a bit simpler is if I, if I clear out, I can just hit delete here, clear out all these center marks here. Um, and I, actually, I think I need to undo here. So let me just undo back. Let's just get rid of all that. So the other thing I could have done is just gone in here, uh, not in edit given pencil marks mode. And if I just remove these, the logical solver does respect my center marks. So I could now hit solution path here and you can see it's just naked singles. So that, that is how I set this puzzle. I think that this method should really clean up a lot of the, the frustration of setting puzzles. And of course, this works with constraints as well. It's not just for setting classics. And in fact, it could be even more useful with, with very restrained rule sets. Like, let's say you want to set an anti-knight puzzle. It's not always clear uh, what you're doing is going to break the puzzle. And so as you go with the anti-knight, it will tell you, hey, don't don't give something there, or these are the possibilities. And you can compare that to what logically uh, would be found in that way. And you can you can sort of add in your own interesting steps as you go. And so that that's kind of the difference between a human uh, created puzzle and a computer created puzzle. And I think I've preserved the human aspect here. I've just sort of smoothed out the frustration of having to go and figure out whether the action you've taken has ruined what you're trying to do. Um, it just really streamlines that process because finding that out is really about just solving it and seeing what happens. And you might not even understand that, you know, you might miss something and then it's a test solver who comes and goes, oh, I found an easy bypass or something like that. So I think that that's uh, a really cool aspect of using this. Do let me know if you... Um, find this useful. Um, I hope you do. And again, if you aren't subscribed, please do remember to subscribe. 
and you know leave a comment below like the video all that good stuff and i hope to see you in my streams